Royal Oak. Beloved worshiping community, the name of my sermon comes from Paul's letter. I have not stopped giving thanks for you. So, what do you think the kind of letter you would write would be if you were locked up in jail? Now, this is probably not something you normally imagine or think about. But if you were in jail, would you write a letter that, uh, that was pleading your case to uh, an attorney? Uh, would you write a letter complaining about the injustice of being in jail? Would you write a letter to your family saying how much you missed them? Or, or, or maybe a, a letter telling them your innocence and how you've been wronged? Or would you write a love letter? Paul was in jail when he wrote Ephesians. Ephesians is one of four letters that Paul wrote while he was under house arrest. And it wasn't addressed to the church in Ephesus to correct problems of bad behavior, wasn't trying to fix anything they were doing wrong. This letter to the Ephesians that Paul wrote in jail was just encouraging all of Jesus' followers to continue in their holy and sacred and joyful call. You see, in case you haven't guessed it, this letter that Paul wrote was a letter of complete euphoria. This might have easily been called the letter to the Euphorians. But it's really the letter to the Ephesians. But what I'd like you to do, Bruce, when you get a moment, just put it up on the screen. Um, I looked at this letter yes, last night. I looked, or this week, actually, but it was only last night that I got this crazy idea. If we take verses 1 to 23, there are so many correspondences in verses 1 to 23. Paul is so excited and energized, even though he is in jail, that he just can't help but repeat himself about how excited he is about God's glory. So it starts off, verse 15, for this reason I have not stopped giving thanks for you. But let's go to verse three. Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms. Now he says that in verse three, but if we go down to verse 20, he says something similar. God raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. So even though Paul is stuck in jail, you can see where his heart is. You can see where his spirit is in the heavenly realms with Jesus. And then Paul finishes verse 3 with these words, with every spiritual blessing in Christ. But that's not the last time Paul uses that phrase, in Christ. He also uses it in verse 8, which he proposed in Christ. And he uses that thankfulness in Christ in verse 13. And you were included in Christ when you heard the gospel message of your salvation. And so Paul just can't stop but repeat himself. He is so full of joy. In verse 5, in love, he predestined us for adoption through sonship in Christ. But that's not the last time he talks about our adoption into God's family. In verse 14, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance? And if we go down to verse 18, in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance. So time and time again, Paul is reminding the people outside of the jail that God has adopted them and they are brothers and sisters in Christ. In verse seven, Paul says, we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he has lavished on us. Now it's not common that somebody sitting in jail would use the word lavished 
on us. Except remember that Paul in his mind is not sitting in jail. Paul in his mind is sitting in God's heavenly kingdom. So let's go to verse 10. To be put in effect when times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Well, wait a second. That's not the only time Paul mentions bringing things in unity because verse 22, he says, and God placed all things under his feet, Jesus, and appointed him to head over everything for the church. Our first talk, song talked about being in God's house. In God's house, Christ reigns in unity over all things on heaven and on earth. And finally, in verse 13, Paul goes on to say, when you believed, you were marked with a seal. When we are baptized, we are sealed and marked in Jesus. When you believed, you were marked with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. And then if we go down a little bit to verse 17, Paul says, I keep asking that the glorious Father may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the spirit of wisdom and truth. And so Paul reminds us that this power from God is the same as the mighty strength that God Christ raised from the dead that put Christ at the right hand of the Father. And so Paul wraps this up in verse 23 by saying about the believers, the followers of Jesus, his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. We, the people of God, are filled in every way with Jesus. And can you imagine writing that kind of letter while you're sitting in a jail cell? It's kind of hard to imagine. And yet this is what Paul did, filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And so, dear God, please come into my mind and heart this morning. Help me to convey the richness, the joy, the euphoria of Paul talking about the wonderful gifts you give us through Jesus. Amen. So again and again, in Paul's letter, it comes down to two words. It comes down to the words hope in Jesus, and it comes down to the word inheritance in Jesus. Hope is what gives Paul the boldness to sit in jail and proclaim and Understand how crazy this was. This was around 60, 62, 63 AD. He is sitting in jail and he's talking about a small church in a port city with Ephesus, which is now Turkey. And he's talking about this small church, some Jews, some Gentiles, as being a new humanity in Jesus. Excuse me, you mean those ragtag people over there? That's the new creation of God in Jesus? Hope is what gives Paul the boldness to make that statement. Paul knows that in Jesus, we're no longer laity or clergy, no longer Jew or Gentile, no longer black or white, rich or poor, Pharisee or tax collector, we are all part of one nation under God. Now, I don't mean one nation under God as in the U.S. is one nation under God. I mean all nations in the world are all one global nation under God. And so what this comes down to is the theology of Paul. And it's actually a Doxology. Now let me explain this term. A doxology is a hymn of praise. And so in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 to 23, Paul is praising God, praising God, praising God. So the theology, the learning about God, is a doxology praising about God. 
And the doxology praise is the theology about God. I have not stopped giving thanks for you. Who is Paul talking about? Paul is talking about this raggedy church of Jews and Gentiles, but he's also talking to Jesus, and he's also talking to God. And everywhere you look, whether on heaven or on earth, Paul cannot stop giving thanks for you. I had a similar experience this past week. It happened to me at 715 on South 9th Street on October 27th in Arlington, Virginia. I experienced this total euphoria of God's love and grace and mercy, and I experienced it uh, not in my heart, not in my soul. I experienced it in my left kneecap. Now, here's how that worked. I was walking around the block in the dark with my granddaughter, Imogen, and she had her teddy in one hand, it, which is not actually a teddy bear, but she calls it teddy, don't ask, and I had a lantern in the other. And as we were walking around the block in the dark, at 7.15, Imogen stopped, and she said, well, basically to my kneecap, G-pop, and that's who she calls me, G-pop, like in grandpop. I really love you. I really love you. I had that total euphoria that Paul is talking about. And, and my euphoria was so great that I said it back to Imogen. I really love you. And Imogen said, gee, Pop, I really, really love you. And I said, I really, really love you. And Imogen said, I really, really, really love you. And I said, I love you more than this, more than this, more than this. And she said, because she's really smart, I love you more than that tree. <laughs> and I said, I love you more than the sky. Now, think about the euphoria that God brings us. It doesn't end, nor does a three-year-old's end either. And she said, uh, I love you more than the moon. Yeah. This is the kind of euphoria, the kind of total love and grace that God is pouring upon us. This is what the letter of Ephesians is talking about. We have hope in the power of God because that hope is what resurrected Jesus. And we know because Jesus was resurrected and we are part of God's family, we have been given an inheritance. And those of you that have ever gotten an inheritance, that's something that you don't earn, right? It's just like a gift, except in the movies when it makes a great plot point. So Ephesians is reminding us of a couple things. And Professor Sally Brown said it way better than I ever could. These are her words. Ephesians tells us that the human struggle with all our strutting power and stumbling failure plays out within a vast landscape lit by the hope of God's future. The reign of Christ is not the future, maybe, the reign of Christ has already begun. That is what Ephesians is telling us. We have hope, verse 18, in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. And this hope is connected with the resurrection of our living Lord and Savior. As Jesus lives, we also shall live. But you know, there's an extension of that phrase. Because as Jesus loves we also shall love. Reverend Jan Richardson, a really awesome Methodist pastor, talks about the actions of hope. Listen carefully, her words. Hope asks us to pray for illumination in this life. 
hope asks us to open ourselves to what we do not know. Hope asks us to imagine what is beyond our imagining. And hope asks us to bear in God what seems unbearable. So Royal Oak, got some questions. What are you hoping for? And where do you find your hope? And, and when you find your hope, what does your hope call you to do? You know, every week we have our blessings and concerns. And in our blessings and concerns, we are expressing our hope in the power and mercy and grace of God. We lift up those who are sick, those who have died, those who are struggling. And we give them over to God's care. Because we know that God will bless them. And the amazing thing about hope is we don't have to tell God what to do or how to do it or when to do it. But because we have hope, we know that God will take care with love in God's time, in God's way. And that, that is awesome. <clears throat> Every Sunday in our church, in our blessings and concerns, we live into hope. But when you go home, think about what you're hoping for and how God comes into this mix. And then what does hope in God call you to do? Maybe this week you'll discover something you've never done before. But you know, it doesn't end because Paul says, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. And the other part of this hope is verse 11. We have been freely given inheritance. God's adopted us into his family. We have been uh, chosen. What is the inheritance God gives us? House, car. <clears throat> Good hair? No. Okay, clearly not. Um, an inherit for some of us, an inheritance of God is peace and love and forgiveness and healing and blessing. And Jesus reminded of this us of this and he just did not let us forget this that just because we are God's chosen with an inheritance that doesn't mean we're the in crowd and all the other people are the out crowd because in God's inheritance in the world of Jesus there is no in or out there is only child of God and really what the inheritance asks of us is to be God's instruments in this world God's instruments for peace and love and forgiveness and healing and blessing. What our inheritance demands of us is that we work for God's purposes. And when we don't know what they are, we pray that we know what they are. And it also asks that we do not work for our own purposes. King David was an example of that. We do not want to do that. So, Royal Oak, beloved worshiping community, how are we being instruments of God in this world? How are we living into our inheritance? You know, I held up that produce. One way we're living into being an instrument of God's peace and love. Every Sunday morning when you come to church and you're fellowshipping, you are living into in being an instrument of God's peace and love. I'm guessing that, that, that those of you that are more outgoing and, and reach out to someone who's more ingoing, you may have no idea how good you make that person feel. 
just by reaching out because that might not be something they are comfortable doing because they're more ingoing. That's an easy and wonderful example that happens in the sanctuary every Sunday. But then I'm guessing that you take the work of the sanctuary and put it out into the world. Or Halloween drive through slash lawn party. Beautiful example of that. Some members of our church now are members because of that outreach. Or Delmarva Blood Bank. First time we've done this since I've been here. But what a wonderful way to take our inheritance of health and give it to those who are in need. And our Operation Christmas Child boxes, we've been doing that for years, and what an astonishing blessing that is. I hope uh, on the 13th, Bruce, can we make a note to show the video again of Operation Christmas Child on the 13th? I was amazed to see the kids and the faces and the joy when they got what they got. This is our inheritance. This is really given to us, and this is how we live into it. And so, our hope in God and our inheritance from God leads us to a way of life that flows. Love that. <laughs> flows from the experience of God's grace in our lives so we may give God's grace to others. I have not stopped giving thanks for you. Paul is saying this 2,000 years ago, and he is saying it today. And I, Pastor Tim, am saying it today also. I have not stopped giving thanks for you. And so why this is why the letter to the Ephesians, or as I like to call them, Euphorians, is so joy, F-U-L-L, -L, full. We are reminded that we are God's chosen, adopted into his family. We are reminded that we are lavished upon by so many of his blessings. We are reminded that we have Christ as our king. We are reminded that we are filled by the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. And we are reminded that we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And all of this happens because of our certain hope in the resurrection. So, we give thanks and we give praise for this. We give thanks knowing that we are blessed. We sit in this congregation in blessings. We walk out the door in blessings. Blessings, we drive home in blessings, we live our lives in blessings, we go to sleep in God's blessing, and we wake up each day in God's blessing. And whether or not we are in home or in jail, we are always in God's love. And for that, we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.